Well, good morning. Uh, I'm Bill Convery. I'm the state historian at History Colorado, formerly the Colorado Historical Society. Um, and you may have heard that we moved recently. Uh, we shut down the Museum at 13th and Broadway, and we packed up our entire collection of 250,000 objects and more than 15 million pages of printed and handwritten materials, and we put it away in temporary storage, and we uh, found an off-site place to live for a little while while they were building our new museum at 12th and Broadway, and we moved in there in September, and we'll be opening the new History Colorado Center in April, uh, April 28th, in fact, of this year. Uh, for historians like myself who are fond of the Colorado Historical Society and its collections, it was kind of heartbreaking to watch uh, our curators packing away our collections and our books and our manuscripts. Uh, because for people like me as a historian, those documents, those items, represent voices of people from the past. And for the last 19 months or so, uh, until our library opened back up in January, uh, History Colorado was a very quiet place because we didn't have those voices uh, that spoke to us all the time about their hopes and their dreams, their aspirations, their fears. Um, that was the lifeblood of History Colorado. And for many of us, and I'm sure there are some here who share this, uh, it was a very happy day when our library opened back up uh, a couple of months ago. Uh, because those voices uh, came right back to life. And what I'm here to talk to you, to you about today are some of the voices in our, in our large collection in downtown Denver. Um, the letters between uh, Estelle, Estella Siglin and Homer Evans of Boughton, Iowa. Um, Estella Siglin and Homer Evans uh, met in college in Cedar Rapids, Iowa in the early 1900s. They fell in love, they became engaged, and they decided to move west to Colorado uh, to start a new life uh, homesteading on the eastern Colorado Plains near Akron, Colorado in 1908. There we go. Um, you can see from the star roughly where they homesteaded in northwestern Washington County. Uh, eastern Colorado was in the midst of a large land boom in the early 1900s. Uh, there had been an earlier boom and, and then a bust in the late 1800s. But by 1908, 1909, 1910, um, landowners were moving out from the eastern cities, uh, from farms in the Midwest, and into the dry plains of Colorado and Nebraska and Kansas, the Dakotas, Oklahoma, Texas, uh, to take up homesteads uh, on, on unirrigated swatches of land. Uh, they were encouraged to do that by the federal government, who in 1909 passed the Enlarged Homestead Act, which effectively doubled the amount of land that homesteaders could take up uh, for free. The Homestead Act was passed in 1862 by Congress. It allowed uh, heads of households to make a claim on 160 acres of land, and if they could, within five years, improve that claim by building uh, buildings and fences, by plowing the land, by planting and harvesting crops, uh, they would own that land outright free of charge. Uh, that was a system that worked very well where there was a lot of rain. 160 acres was a unit that allowed homesteaders uh, in, in the east uh, to be successful. But west of about the 100th meridian, uh, it became very difficult for homesteaders to make a living on 160 acre units. So in 1909, Congress passed a law that doubled that to 320 acres. And the Expanded Homestead Act of 1909 really encouraged more people to try and make a new life on the dry plains of places like eastern Colorado. And Estella Siglin and Homer Evans were one couple who wanted to do this. They each took up an adjacent homestead of 320 acres, giving them together an entire section of 640 acres for their homestead. Uh, but although they were land rich suddenly, they were still cash poor. And Homer decided to remain in Iowa taking jobs on road construction crews uh, to raise money while Estella moved to Colorado in 1908 to teach school and to begin farming on their new land. And between 1908 and 1910, the couple lived separately, one in Iowa, one in Colorado, trying to make a living, try, trying to achieve their dream together uh, on the plains of Colorado. They corresponded quite a bit, and we are fortunate at History Colorado to have their collection. Well, I should say we have one side of the collection. Uh, we have Estella's letters to Homer. 
he saved his letters, and uh, and I, I should have moved ahead to this slide. Uh, this is a slide of what farming was like in, near Akron in about 1910. The main crop was dry land wheat. That was wheat that did not require irrigation, but received its uh, its moisture from uh, rainfall for the most part. Uh, it was a very chancy way to make a living. It, it worked really well when there was rain, but when there wasn't rain, um, farmers really suffered. Fortunately, it, between about 1908 and 1920, uh, there were years of above average rainfall in places like eastern Colorado. So uh, my great grandfather, who was a homesteader in eastern Colorado in Washington County in 1910, talked about the grass coming up to his shoulders. Uh, it was just wonderful land for dry land wheat and for cattle uh, and for other dry land crops, pinto, pinto beans and other crops. Uh, so those were the good years, such as they were. Uh, this is the house that they lived in initially. Uh, this was their utopia, if you can imagine, their, their farmer's heaven uh, out in eastern Colorado. It was a life uh, that was very challenging for Estella Siglin when she moved out. She was not a farmer. She was a college-educated woman uh, who was coming out to try and make a living in eastern Colorado. Uh, she needed the support of Homer to do this, both the financial support but also the emotional support that he uh, provided through his letters. And so in between her labors, Estella wrote passionate letters to, home, to her fiancé, Homer. Um, the letters reflect her longing for Homer and her faith in God and providence. Uh, they reflect the teasing uh, person, nature of her personality and the patience she had in waiting for Homer to ultimately rejoin her. The letters have an occasional scolding, often followed by a promise to write more often. And the subjects of these letters vary from their wedding plans to uh, more prosaic topics like digging irrigation ditches or planting potatoes. Increasingly, as the letters go on, you feel a strain of, of increasing romance and loneliness in these letters as well, and, and more pleas to Homer to, to come out and join her in Colorado. In her letters, Estella coordinated the psalms that the couple read together each evening over long distance. She teased Homer about uh, interesting local bachelors in the neighborhood and their prospects. She daydreamed about their future together, writing, really, sweetheart, I'd like to have a good home here if I thought we could make a decent living. Guess we could stand it if we didn't make more than a living for a year or two if the country makes good. How long is it that people ordinarily live on love? She enclosed plump heads of wheat in her letters to show the region's promise, to assure Homer that, yes, things were going to be okay. And one time, she enclosed a large rattlesnake rattle uh, uh, of a rattlesnake that she had killed, not just to demonstrate the dangers of living in Col eastern Colorado, but also to reassure her love that she had the ability to pr protect herself. And that's another theme that comes out very interestingly in these letters, uh, Estella's increasing independence. She is the one who is having to make the day-to-day -day decisions about uh, farm management and about raising the crops that they need. She has to make those decisions on her own, certainly with advice and consent from Homer, but Estella is the one on the ground. And you can see her transform from early letters uh, as kind of a city slicker into an independent farm woman over time, who certainly desires Homer's presence and support, but in time does not, uh, can certainly live without it. Now that said, she certainly missed Homer. She entreats him uh, to join her in almost every letter, writing the absurdity of this, to cuddle up close with 650 miles between us. And eventually the strain of their prolonged separation surfaced in their correspondence but the couple continued to resolve to be together even after three long years. And their determination was eventually realized when Homer rejoined Estella in Colorado. They married, they raised two daughters of their own, and they became respected, prosperous local citizens in Akron. Now the reason these stories are important to me is the way that they bring to life pivotal moments in our history. But these are not the stories of great men and women. These are the stories of everyday lives, of men and women who, through their simple daily acts, create the history 
uh, that we are a part of today. It's our mission at History Colorado to engage the most well-informed and cultivated citizens who understand the past in the context of the present so that they can make good decisions about the future. The story of Homer and Estella is certainly a story of sacrifice, but it's also a story of increasing confidence and of passion for each other and of interdependence as well. It's hard to make a living in Colorado. Colorado is a place of wonderful promise, as represented by these plump heads of wheat that Estella sent her love. It's also a place of hardship and sacrifice, as represented by the rattlesnake rattle that she sent him to assure her that she could hold her own. Because of those, that promise and that threat of hardship, people have always been challenged to live the good life here. Homer and Estella show us that you don't need to be a great man or a great woman, that there's a greatness inside all of our everyday acts in order to enjoy life here in Colorado. And that's a story that we appreciate and that we love to tell and retell. And that's the story that's embedded in those thousands of voices in our collection uh, at the Stephen Hart Research Center at History Colorado. They asked me to put this in just to give a little plug uh, to some of our uh, other programs at History Colorado, which also talk about the voices of everyday people. Um, at the History Colorado Center, we're opening two new exhibits in April, one called Destination Colorado, which is in fact uh, a story about dry land farming in eastern Colorado in a town called Kyoto, Colorado in northeastern Weld County. Uh, and it's a, the story about the men and the women who, who made their lives there and, and really believed that they were reaching out for the American dream. And for a moment, they grasped it until the environmental conditions and the economic conditions of the 1920s and 30s snatched that dream away. We're also telling the story of the men and women and children who were incarcerated in an internment camp in southeastern Colorado called Amachi. We're very much telling the story through their voices, through their letters, including the letter of a Japanese-American veteran of the 442nd Regimental Combat Team serving in Italy who wrote a letter home to his father uh, explaining the reasons why it was important for him and his brothers to, to put on the American uniform and defend a country which had imprisoned his family. Um, these are stories which tell us about who we are and part of our character as well. And I'm delighted that our uh, archive is back open and that those voices are speaking to us again. If you would like to hear some of those voices, you can certainly do that. Um, uh, the Stephen Hart Research Center is located at 1200 Broadway. It's open by appointment right now, Wednesdays through Fridays, and it will open a Monday through Saturday, um, excuse me, Tuesday through Saturday, uh, beginning on April 28th. In the meantime, you can check out its catalog at www.historycolorado.org. It's been a pleasure speaking with you today, and thank you very much.